All righty. And already we're getting a lot of people joining us. Thank you everyone who's joining us today. We're going to give it about three minutes before we get started to allow everyone time to join. Great. Thank you guys for joining. I'm seeing lots of names pop in. Good morning. Good morning, everyone joining us. We're going to get started here in a couple of minutes just to allow time for people to filter in. Good morning, Katie. All right. If you guys are having trouble hearing me, please let me know in the chat box. You should have that option down below. Good morning, Mike. Okay, we're just gonna give it maybe one more minute. Audio is good. Thank you so much, John. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Sounds fine here. Great. Thank you, Leaf. Yes, you are all muted. Um, this is a webinar, so we can't hear you, but you should be able to hear us just fine. There are gonna be options for chat and Q&A though. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Roland. Hello, hello. All righty. Okay, great. It sounds like everyone can hear us. We're at about 9.03. I know we have, thank you, Jonathan. I know we have a lot to cover. So I actually do wanna go ahead and get started with the webinar. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Tina and let her do our introduction. So thank you guys for joining us again. Tina, it's all yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I have a few organizational items. Uh, we will aim to keep the presentation to 60 minutes and then allow time for questions. Uh, questions will be answered at the end, so please submit questions via Q&A tool. Um, use the chat if you have general, general feedback or considerations, and use the raise hand feature if you're having a technical issue with the webinar. Um, so let's get started. In one way or another, each of us have been affected by the pandemic as a result of COVID-19 virus. Um, did you know the global ultraviolet disinfection equipment market is anticipated to reach $9.4 billion by 2027, as reported by Grandview Research? The rising investments related to the expansion and the upgrade of various facilities are expected to boost the product demand over the coming years. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce the team that we have here today. With Kelly, we have Katie Campbell, our marketing director, Rachel Gunther, our lead marketing principal at the controls, and my name is Tina Nelson, your product managers that the product manager that's responsible for the creation of the new category disinfection for Kelly. Um, our goal is to continuously solve for your HVAC needs and solutions, especially during critical times such as these. We are your key supplier for fresh air UV disinfection systems. And I'm extremely excited to have them join us today. In the past several months, I've worked closely with Aaron at Fresh Air to outline the best fit disinfection products for our customers <clears throat> at Kelly. And I'm learning more and more on how we can better serve our customers in the new segment. Fresh Air is a US-based global manufacturer in UV disinfection. Our speaker today is Aaron Engel. And he is the Vice President of Business Development at Fresh Air and has 20 plus years in the design, manufacturing, and marketing of UV for domestic and international applications. And those applications include residential, commercial, and healthcare. Um, Aaron has worked with various 
universities, accredited labs, and research groups on the definitive study of UV inactivation of airborne diseases, and most recently, the accreditation of Fresh Air's UV technology against the spread of COVID-19. Aaron's a veteran of the indoor air quality realm of business and brings not only hands-on experience, but the knowledge and understanding of how impactful UV disinfection is globally. He's a frequent guest speaker and lecturer on IAQ, as well as UV disinfection. He also serves as a voting member on various ASHRAE committees. Um, today, we will talk about how the increasing investments to the UV expansion as it relates to the HVAC market, and more importantly, how it relates to you and your projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, Tina. Thank you to everybody at Kelly for inviting us uh, today to present to all of you. I have a number of, uh, of fresh air UV personnel as well on the call. Uh, I will be closing my, uh, my camera in lieu of bringing up the presentation. So bear with me a moment here while we get things all ready. Well, of course, once again, thank you everyone for joining us. It's a very exciting time for us all, uh, a very challenging time for, for many of us. And certainly one of the reasons why you decided to join us today is because of the awareness uh, as far as ultraviolet and regards to SARS-CoV-2, the pandemic that we're all dealing with. And, and certainly we're gonna learn a lot about how Kelly uh, and Fresh Air UV uh, has systems designed to address many of your IEQ issues and concerns, but I always like to start off any presentation by giving you a little bit of a background of who Fresh Air UV actually is. Uh, we are one of, if not the largest providers of UV disinfection systems in North America and potentially globally. We are situated in Jupiter, Florida and South Florida, where we manufacture, market, um, promote, research, design, Everything that we do in-house is done at Fresh Air UV. We could not be prouder of the company and, and the people behind the Fresh Air UV product. Certainly, um, things have changed so much over the course of the last year. What you see there in the top left corner is a, a small uh, number of us at the AHR Expo in Orlando last February and uh, almost actually to the day. It was last, last week, which was the one-year anniversary of the AHR Expo, and uh, it, it's just incredible how life has changed since since those uh, the, those days a year ago. Hey, Aaron. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Are you sharing slides at the moment? We have um, people in the chat saying they are unable to to see. Oh, you, you yeah. I you, do you not see the slides? No, not at this moment. Okay, let's let's start again. I'm so sorry. No worries. Okay, you tell me if this is. Yes, we can see your we can see your screen now. Can you Perfect. see the full screen or the or the preview screen? Full screen, we got you. Okay, okay. I don't know what happened right. there. Okay, well we're gonna no start worries. again. Okay, all right. Take number no two. No worries. Thank so, you, thank you, thank so, you all so, for, for letting us know you weren't able to see your see your screens. All right. That's thank right. You. Okay. Well, of course, going back to what I was saying. There, there certainly is, is a huge demand, a huge interest in, in ultraviolet disinfection technology. Certainly any uh, technology that could improve the occupant's well-being, especially in light of SARS-CoV-2, would be something that'd be very interesting to you and, of course, you know, your customers or your own very facilities. So what would we be if it wasn't for Fresher UV and the people behind uh, the, the company? We do everything in-house. This is our 30,000 square foot facility in, in Jupiter, Florida. We've just secured an additional 30,000 square foot facility in order to address all the demand that has been building over the past year. So where we were in a very uh, a positive position last year going into 2020, certainly the increased awareness of ultraviolet disinfection technologies has really pushed forward fresher, fresher UV. So of course, who would we be if not for our people? 
as I mentioned, this is a, a select group of us at the AHR Expo last year in Orlando, Florida, and uh, an incredible, you know, a, a year later, look, look where we all are. So I invite you all when things get better, we are very, very uh, happy to entertain anybody who wants to learn more about the company as well as our products and technology to come and visit us. You see there one of our tours that we were uh, providing to uh, interested distributors and, and customers to learn more about Fresh Air UV. But certainly, of course, why we're all joining here today is, is to see and learn how ultraviolet technologies could address airborne viral contaminants. And it, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I've been doing a lot of these presentations and, and the very first question was, does UV disinfection light actually address the SARS-CoV-2 virus? And it really was never a question, does UV light address the virus? It was a question of, at how much UV dosage would be required to inactivate the virus. And although at the beginning of the pandemic, we did not know what the defined UV dosage was for inactivating SARS-CoV-2, we certainly did know what the UV dosage requirement was for SARS-CoV-1. That was defined back in 2004. So we had a very strong, uh, strong understanding of how much UV we had to deliver to effectively address SARS-CoV-2. Now, the question still remains, not is UV effective, but what is the vectors? How is the virus transmitted? At the beginning of the, of the pandemic, it was close contact and within a six foot radius of an individual. And as we learn more and more information about the virus, we're learning how it's transmitted and the various vectors. And now we do understand that it certainly can be airborne and can be even distributed through the HVAC system. So, what Fresher UV wanted to do uh, a few months ago is really garner a real understanding of how UV uh, can affect the virus, SARS-CoV-2 specifically. There's a lot of data now um, you know, showing how effective UV is, but it was really on longer exposure times. Uh, 30 minutes, one hour, and of course, if you were able to uh, irradiate that virus for an extended amount of time, certainly uh, UV would be very effective, but our testing wanted to see how effective UV disinfection was on very limited short exposure times, simulating what would be happening in the moving air, where you only have a, a fraction of a second to actually um, deliver that lethal dosage for an activation. So fresh air UV moved forward with 30 individual time points and distant points on various products that we manufacture from our ADS commercial system to our BTXL commercial system and even our APCOX commercial uh, residential system. And although, as I mentioned, we had a very strong understanding of how effective UV would be on SARS-CoV-1, we were actually very surprised how well our UV systems performed when tested against SARS-CoV-2. Essentially, uh, from 0.25 seconds to a half a second to one second and up to two seconds, we were able to deliver up to greater than 99.99% inactivation of of the virus. We neutralized the virus actually much quicker than we believed we actually could. So, you know, this even now is probably one of the very first uh, testing that I've seen on such limited short exposure times when uh, addressing specifically SARS-CoV-2, not a surrogate. So we're very, very excited and very happy to have these test results in hand. And it just further uh, it just further uh, um, shows how effective UV can be if properly delivered. Now, certainly uh, we were at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were being contacted by a number of facilities and institutions asking fresher UV, how much UV do we need to deliver to effectively disinfect N95 respirators? And we were very, very surprised at the number of inquiries that were coming into fresher UV. The very first picture you see there is actually a refrigerator from a hospital in, in Georgia that took the refrigerator from the cafeteria, emptied the contents, drilled two holes, inserted two of our residential UV lights and asked for recommendations on time. How much time do we need to deliver to effectively disinfect the N95s? And those examples were by the dozens. The next example is a first line responder, an ambulance technician, and the examples just kept coming in. And we found it so unique that although we are a leader in HVAC UV disinfection, how is it that organically speaking, these uh, healthcare workers and first line responders were contacting us 
for recommendations for disinfecting PPE. It just so happens back in 2018 when, uh, you know, no one had issues with uh, supply chain for N95s, the FDA sponsored a testing that was published in the American Journal of Infection Control on UV's ability to effectively disinfect and extend the life of N95s. And this was probably one of, if not the definitive study to show that UV works very well at addressing viral contaminants on the mask. And uh, the FDA followed uh, and, and the CDC put out recommendations on uh, actually using UV and other technologies uh, during the beginning of the pandemic to extend the N95s. And this was one of the studies that they used to show the efficacy of ultraviolet light. It just so happens that it was fresher UV systems that were used in the testing of these N95s. And when those who know reviewed the American Journal of Infection Control test data, obviously fresher UV was highlighted and they were contacting us. So fresher UV was put in a very, very unique situation, not only obviously addressing all our HVAC core customers, but trying the best we can to address first line and healthcare providers in order to disinfect their very important N95 respirators. Thankfully, those days are behind us. There's no supply chain issues and we could focus all our attention to our HVAC customers and, and facilities. For those who are not familiar with fresh air UV, as I mentioned, we are a leader in UV for HVAC. Since 2001, over 2 million UV systems installed worldwide. We're known for our multiple patents, and we're also known for our reliability. Most all of our systems carry a lifetime uh, performance guarantee and warranty. So we very much stand behind our products and we stand behind our, our technology. Now, certainly SARS-CoV-2 opened all our eyes and, and we're probably here today learning about ultraviolet because of that, but certainly the uh, issues of indoor air quality far extend outside of SARS-CoV-2. There's certainly a need for ultraviolet technologies. And uh, well, 40, 50 years ago, you, you really did not need a, a product like, like fresh air UV because we were naturally bringing in fresh outside air and diluting the concentration of biologicals and chemicals that were um, insulating and trapped within the, the envelope of, of the building. But now there is uh, certainly a, a huge need for these types of technologies because we're insulating ourselves like never before. We are not bringing in enough fresh outside air to dilute the concentration of biologicals, chemicals, odors, and VOCs that are trapped within the envelope of, of the building. Some would argue the reason why there's such a rise in allergy and asthma related illnesses is because we're not bringing in enough fresh outside air to dilute the concentration of contaminants that are trapped within the envelope of the building. We should be opening our doors. We should be opening our windows. We should be bringing in fresh outside air to dilute the concentration of contaminants, but we're not doing that. Studies show that the air inside of our homes, inside of our buildings are up to 100 times more polluted than outside. It really is a, a, a huge, huge issue, one that we've never had to face before, but we were building everything so tight. So of course, if you took a test of the air quality, 35% of the contaminants that are trapped within the envelope of the building, of the envelope of the home, is particulates. And that obviously would be addressed by the system filter. But 65% of the contaminants that we are breathing every day, the bacteria, the viruses, the mold, the chemicals, the odors, the VOCs, they make up the majority of the contaminants in the air. So it's always a question of having that frank conversation and educating the end user. Certainly you're using filters to address one third of the contaminants in the air, but what about the other two thirds? Of course, SARS-CoV-2 has really opened our eyes to the importance of the air that we breathe and the importance of good indoor air quality. But certainly uh, before SARS-CoV-2 and hopefully after SARS-CoV-2, we will have a new appreciation of what is in the air and how different technologies could address different issues. So of course, if I'm talking to an end user, if I'm talking to an engineer, if I'm talking to a healthcare provider and I talk about you know, air quality, ultimately they'll talk about filters and, and certainly filters are a huge part of the IAQ puzzle, but the filter is actually designed to keep the equipment running to spec. If the filter was not present, the HVAC equipment would ultimately fail. So the filter is actually designed to maintain 
proper efficiency. And certainly if it's removing particles in the air that you and I would be breathing, it is actually an indoor air quality product. But it's really a question of educating and explaining that obviously filters are great for the particulate side and a properly sized UV system will certainly complement filtration. And the two working in tandem with each other is really part of a complete IAQ puzzle. So there are three separate technologies that are employed for uh, improving indoor air quality. There's obviously UVC light, and that's addressing the biologicals, the bacteria, the viruses, the mold, all those microorganisms. There is another technology called PCO, photocatalytic oxidation, and that is to address chemicals, odors, and VOCs. And of course, we rely on filtration for particulate removal. Now, UV has garnered a lot of attention over the past year. Uh, so much so that I'm thankful that all of you are joining us today. But there's also a lot of misinformation on what ultraviolet is and how it's delivered. Now, if I took a UV camera and I took a picture of the sun, it'd be a fierce blue. That's because the sun produces four distinct wavelengths of UV light, UVA, UVB, UVC, and UVV. Now, we're very aware of UVA and UVB. The front window of your car is the only window that actually has a UVA and UVB filter incorporated into the glass. Sunscreen, sunglasses, all designed to protect us from UVA and UVB exposure. Now, as dangerous as we believe UVA and UVB to be, it actually has very little germicidal power. And a, a great example of that is, is a sunburn. One sunburn will not be an issue for anybody but continually abusing the sun over the course of someone's life has the accumulation of UV to the point of mutation, which presents itself as skin cancer. So the technology and the process of UV disinfection is always based on the accumulation of a dosage. In this case, one sunburn is not, not an issue, but multiple sunburns with that accumulation does pose the issue. Now, fresher UV systems produce UVC light at the 254 nanometer wavelength. Now, we're never, as a planet, um, we're never ever um, um, in contact with UVC light. UVC light is produced by the sun and it's absorbed by the ozone layer. So when we talk about the dangers of the ozone layer, the importance of having the ozone layer, but the dangers of a hole in the ozone layer, a thinning of the ozone layer, that would allow that UVC light to penetrate down to ground level and kill all living organisms on the planet. That's how powerful UVC light in contrast to UVA and UVB energy. But of course, lucky for us, we're never subjected to that wavelength. But ultimately, we're taking that UVC light, that same wavelength at the 254 nanometer wave, wavelength of light, and we're incorporating into the HVAC system. So we're naturally doing inside the HVAC system, addressing the biologicals that's actually happening in the upper atmosphere. A fourth wavelength of light known as UVV at the 185 nanometer is an ozone producing wavelength. Now we do not produce the 185 nanometer. Our lamps are doped not to go below the 254 nanometer. So rest assured that our UV systems are zero ozone emitting, specifically delivering UV at the 254. So to summarize, if I was to look at the visible spectrum of light from blue to red, from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, the invisible UV wavelength falls well below that and once again, we're delivering UVC at the 254 nanometer wavelength of light. Now UV has been used for over a hundred years, but funny enough, UV gained a lot of uh, popularity in the thirties and forties. I've seen a, an antique Westinghouse UV HVAC system, and it had this large cast iron control box, big thick UV tubes, and really it looked very much like a UV system from today. And it was used, uh, healthcare used it in all kinds of innovative means. They were using it to disinfect uh, HVAC for, for surfaces, inside rooms. And um, it continued like that for many years until the 60s and 70s when antibiotics became readily available. And uh, hospitals really pulled back on using UVC disinfection. If someone gets sick, well, they'll take some antibiotics and they'll be A-OK. -okay. Long before SARS-CoV-2, over the past eight to 12 years, 
healthcare has really came full circle and really adopted UV once again. They've adopted UV for HVAC, they've adopted UV for duct mount, they've adopted UV for upper air and even uh, robots that you may have seen in the media. That's because the hospital associated infections, HAIs are costing the healthcare industry tens and tens of billions of dollars every year in uninsurable costs. And uh, now you have anti, um, uh, resistant antibiotic resistant pathogens, MRSA, C. diff, VRE, that if someone gets sick, the antibiotics may not work. So certainly UVC has becoming a very powerful tool in order to address these HAIs that are costing the healthcare industry billions of dollars and of course lives lost. Now with SARS-CoV-2, it's another reason for healthcare to move forward and implement UV technologies. What you see there is one of our UVC ceiling mount units for unoccupied spaces. Concept is environmental surfaces comes in, cleans the operating room, cleans the patient room, and then they leave the room and they light up the room for about eight to 10 minutes, irradiating high touch areas. So UV is a great adjunct to conventional terminal cleaning practices and a great means to hopefully move the needle and address those HAIs. Municipal water treatment centers throughout North America use UV light to treat the water. So it really is becoming a very prevalent and uh, quite arguably a great, great tool in order to address biological contaminants. I'm always asked, how, how does UVC light work? And if I'm lucky enough to be doing an in-person presentation, I usually look for someone wearing a coat or a, a something with a zipper. And, and if I was to take a hammer and, and I was to ask if I was to you know, hit those zippers and, and break the teeth of the zipper, what's gonna happen? Well, essentially you cannot zip up your jacket or your coat. Well, that's what UVC light has the ability to do. It's able to scramble the DNA and RNA of the microorganism. If it's a bacteria, it could, sterilize it. If it's a virus, it, it could cause it to not actually, you know, neutralize it so it doesn't infect another virus, another cell. So UV light has the ability to penetrate through the membrane of the microorganism, scrambling and damaging the DNA or RNA so it cannot replicate. And we're taking that UVC light and we're delivering it to the HVAC system, we're delivering it to ductwork, and as you've seen in the prior slide, delivering it to high touch surfaces. So UV light, it, it really is a mathematical certainty that if I deliver that lethal dosage, that microwatt dosage or the millijoule dosage, I'm able to essentially inactivate any microorganism I may be inclined to do. And this is a great example of, of just that. Now, dosages could be delivered in, in, in microwatts or millijoules or microjoules. For, this, for the sake of this conversation, we're specifically talking about microwatts. And as you see here, this is a small cross-reference of different microorganisms that require a certain amount of dosages for an activation. This is one of the reasons why healthcare, the engineering community uh, really has, the scientific community has really embraced UVC light as the facto means to disinfect is because it's a mathematical certainty that if we deliver the lethal dosage, we can achieve any inactivation rate. And the same cannot be uh, said for other technologies out there in the marketplace. So for example, if we want to address Legionella, which we're all familiar with, certainly could be an issue in drain pans, stagnant water, you require about 3000 microwatts of UV energy dosage for an activation. If we look at Aspilus niger, which is also found in the uh, coil section, if you look on the right side of the column uh, under molds, that requires 330 thousand microwatts. So we have a pretty, pretty uh, uh, varying degree of dosage requirements for a very weak Legionella and a very robust Aspirillus niger. So when a UV system is designed and implemented, it is so important to have an understanding of what it is we want to address and deliver the required dosage requirements in order to achieve that inactivation rate. And the the formula is actually quite, quite simple. It's time times intensity. The more powerful the UV uh, light, the more intense the UV dosage, the intensity, I should say, then the higher uh, the kill rate, the, the longer the dwell time, the longer the exposure uh, in front of the UV lamp, the more UV could be delivered to the target regarding a higher dosage and a, a essentially a higher inactivation rate or kill rate. 
So it's time times intensity equals the kill rate. Now, certainly moving into the pandemic, the question was, well, you know, what is that all important UV dosage requirement for in activating SARS-CoV-2? And it was only until I believe June that we actually had a better understanding of what the dosage requirements actually was. And in this case, you're looking at about 3.7 millijoules or 3,700 microwatts of UV energy to effectively uh, address uh, SARS-CoV-2 to achieve a three log reduction. That's a 99.9% a neutralization of the virus. And as you uh, recall from our, our uh, chart here, um, that's actually on the lower scale of biological targets. So SARS-CoV-2 is actually uh, not a very, it, it's not very resistant to UV and, and uh, it's quite weak actually. So, but all to say is that we're very, very cognizant of what dosage requirements are and, and we have to have that in mind when we make our recommendations on, on UV systems. Now, this is a test I've done hundreds of times and it's, in the, it's a great indicator of what's happening inside the air handling unit. Now, uh, quite often I'm, I'm lucky enough to meet with facilities and, and healthcare providers and uh, I'm, I'm often brought in to meet with the director of facilities who in turn will bring me to their air handling unit to take a look. And um, you know they're, they're typically very proud of, of the nature and the condition of their HVAC unit itself. And uh, we'll, you know, for, for, this, for this conversation, we'll call him Mark. Now, Mark brings me into the air handling unit. We take a look and it, it looks clean, but I explain that what we're obviously looking at is either the leaving or leading edge of the, of the air conditioning coil. And that maybe makes up maybe 5% or less of the actual surface area of the coil itself. The, the surface area is tens and tens of thousands of square feet. And we obviously do not see that that's inside that, that you know, coil section. So I, I ask for, you know, if he minds, you know, and, and usually Mark's always uh, excited to try this, this test. And, and what I pull out are these contact plates or agar plates. And, and what's really unique about these specific plates is that the gelatin is bowed. So you're able to press it in. And, and in this case, we press it into the coil, the fins of the coil slices into the gelatin. We cap it, we tape it. I give one to Mark. I take one back with me. He puts it in a drawer for three or four days, a dark, dark drawer, obviously. And then I call Mark up. And I say, Mark, you know, what happened with those discs? And, and for some reason, they, he always forgets that he did this test. He goes, oh yeah, Aaron, one second. Let me, let me grab it, I'll be right back. A minute or two goes by and, and all I hear is, oh my God, and silence. And, and I know what's going on because I have a disc on my end. I know what he's looking at. He's looking at a, at a contact plate that he was expecting to be clean, where now it's spotted, there's slime, it, it, every color of the rainbow sometimes. And it is, it is quite contaminated with mold and fungus. And, and I, I ask him if he's okay. And he's like, Aaron, I can't believe that this is, what's in, this is an indicator of what's hap actually happening in my air handling unit. And I say, absolutely. Now we go back and we install a UV system on the, on the coil section inside the air handler. And we do a post test a day later, 10 hours later, and it's 99.99. Uh, reduced there. You literally go from a, 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 a contact plate that is overrun with mold and, and fungus and contamination and bacteria to a, uh, a contact plate that looks absolutely perfect after three or four days of being cultured. That is indicative of what is happening inside your air handling unit. Now, we have a, a robust residential line and we do very well with our residential products through HVAC distribution as well. And some of the most common testimonials we get at Fresh Air UV after an installation is, I have not slept this well in 20 years. We do not know why we wake up congested with a tickle in our throat, a slight cough. I would argue that the contaminants that are inside the evaporator coil, inside the drain pan, continually gets blown and reintroduced into the living area. Studies have shown that the condition of our air quality is severely impacted by the condition of the HVAC system. So if there's one thing that I would wish that you leave here today, of course, SARS-CoV-2 is top of mind, no doubt about that, but the condition of our HVAC equipment is imperative. And the condition of that HVAC equipment is directly correlated to how we feel inside of our homes or inside of our buildings. So please, moving forward, do not lose sight of the coil, do not lose sight of the drain pan. This is definitely a most strategic location for any UV system to address those microbial contaminants that are growing inside the dark, cool confines of the air handling unit. 
Now, certainly, uh, UV has been around for many, many years. It was only until 2008 that ASHRAE actually included UV in their handbook, and there's been about a, a dozen or so chapters since. I myself am a member of TC 2.9 Ultraviolet Lamp Systems. I'm also the programs chair for TC 2.9. ASHRAE is fully invested in moving uh, indoor air quality, uh, improving indoor quality forward. And of course, UV makes a very big part of that, uh, that tool chest and, and nothing um, illustrates that as well as the uh, ASHRAE epidemic task force that has been pushing forward since the onset of the pandemic strategies that facilities and buildings could implement to improve indoor air quality and UVC light for air handling units, for ductwork, for mobile, for surface has been a big part of the epidemic task force strategy. So certainly has brought even more credibility to what we've done in the UV industry. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, has been using UV for tuberculosis for a long time, for decades. The GSA, the General Service Administration, does mandate that all new government facilities do have UV installed on the evaporator coil. The US Green Build and Well Building Standards are two associations that are also uh, invested into ultraviolet. Green Build for, new, for points for innovative technologies. And well building standard is getting a lot of notoriety recently, uh, but they take the well being of the occupants health as a priority and UV makes uh, also a large component of the well building standard. Now I would usually use this slide to really show how UV has come so far in, in so many years. Um, it's been a long time that UV has been gaining, gaining, gaining this traction. But in reality, the um, you know what has transpired over the past one year has really done more so than this one chart. There's just so much more awareness on ultraviolet, and certainly uh, when you're looking to address your own facilities, uh, you you certainly I'm sure going to be looking at ultraviolet technologies as a possible piece of that solution. Now, of course. Um, you know, what we've been doing in healthcare for, for 20 years is obviously improving uh, the, the, the well-being of, of the occupants and hopefully trying to control those hospital-associated so infections. But certainly what we've been doing in healthcare for so many years directly translates to any facility, shopping mall, school, office building. We're trying to improve equipment efficiency. We're trying to uh, improve air quality and we're trying to hopefully make the facility a healthier environment for, for all those occupants. Which brings us really to our, our first product lead in, which is our AHU series. And obviously all these products are available through Kelly and, and I do recommend you reaching out to your Kelly uh, sales representative for additional information. The uh, AHU series is a cost-effective means to really get ultraviolet inside your air handling unit. It's a small footprint. It's a power supply, a commercial power supply that could fire additional smaller lamps. It is a small format UV system, typically up to 16 inch lamps. Uh, this is great for those light commercial, smaller systems, maybe up to five tons. You see there an example of an air handling unit. You would never have as many UV lights as you see there, but it gives you an understanding of the different strategies and different locations you can mount the UV system. What's nice about the AHU series is that it's very simple to install. It, uh, it's available with their included magnet mount, which is really, really a refined, easy to use, easy to install uh, magnet, uh, magnet mount, you know, which, which really is, um, is a simple, simple. There's nothing else like it. We're really big into magnets and whenever we could use magnets, we do use magnets. The systems themselves have IP68 rated plugs, which means that typically what will cause an issue for a UV lamp is moisture penetration. And because our lamps are watertight, we don't have those issues. The power supply is available from 110 to 277 volt. Again, a really refined product that makes it uh, easy to start implementing UV for your own facilities or, or for your customers. The system also has, as I mentioned earlier, a lifetime guarantee, and that's uh, that's common across the fresher UV line. Now, there's been a lot of interest for hospitality, and for good reason. Ho hotels uh, and other um, hospitality facilities are, are looking to open up and, and put their guests' mind at ease. 
and nothing uh, probably would, would move the needle more than knowing that the air quality inside a, a guest room is being treated and disinfected. I know even long before SARS-CoV-2, I've stayed at a lot of hotels and I know, you know, there's so many I would have hoped would have implemented UV light to disinfect what was coming out of their PTAC or terminal units. So our tight fit unit is a small, um, small UV lamp with a magnet mount, very, very refined, easy to install, easy to slip into those very small tight spaces, great for terminal fan coil units and PTACs. And it does a great job of addressing the coil, the biological blow off, the microbial contamination that gets reintroduced into the room, as well as disinfect the air on a continual basis. So when a hospital uh, or, or a hotel or an army barrack or a dormitory is looking to do something to improve the air quality inside the room without having to install a self-contained portable unit, which could get very, very costly, the tight fit kit is a great solution to make their own uh, AC system into an air treatment system. And that, that's essentially what, what we wanna do in all these applications is take advantage of the fan that you're already using and install uh, a secondary UV lamp in order to address the air as the air continually recirculates through, through the room. Now, uh, we are very popular among ice machine makers and users uh, as we know, ice machines are prone to microbial load and ultraviolet, as we now know, is very effective at addressing that. Now, fresher UV is installed in some of the nation's largest gas retailers, and they like to use our UV systems in their concession area where you purchase your, your beverages for their ice machines. So before one of the largest providers of um, uh, gas providers uh, move forward to implement or cross US and Canada uh, UV uh, systems for their ice machines, they wanted to see, well, how effective they actually are. So they, they purchased two brand new ice machines and uh, one, they did not install the UV light and that's reflected in the pictures with the green uh, outline. And the other ice machine, they did install the UV system and that's obviously the blue outline. Now they want to see how effective the UV system was over a 10 month period. And as you could see from the pictures, these were taken at the 10, 10 month point. And there's obviously visible microbial load. And when I'm talking about ice machines, I mentioned slime, there's visible slime on the ice machine without the UV light. And certainly the ice machine with the UV light looks pretty clean. A few years ago, the Today Show on NBC this did a segment, America, what's the most contaminated thing you touch on a daily basis? And uh, they, they ran across the country from coast to coast, swabbing, uh, you know, everything they could imagine, toilet seats, doorknobs, buttons on elevators, handrails. And what caught my attention in the segment wasn't necessarily a segment itself, is that they were using what is called an ATP tester to test these surfaces. And if you're not familiar with an ATP tester, it looks like an ohmmeter with a Q-tip. And, and they take the Q-tip and they swab down a, a doorknob, for example, they put it into the ATP tester and it gives them a number, a numerical value. And that's called an RLU, a relative light unit. The higher the number, the more contaminated. So they went across the country, swabbing down everything you can imagine, putting it into the, uh, into the ATP tester and calculating and measuring. And well, the results are in. They, they were excited to, to tell America that the most contaminated thing that you could touch on a daily basis, not a toilet seat, not a doorknob, not a button on an elevator, it was the backseat of a Chicago taxi cab. And they made such a big deal about it. A, a toilet seat had 200 RLUs, but the backseat of the Chicago taxi cab measured 4,000 RLUs. And they, they really, they made it into such a big deal. Well, I know full well that this ice machine that we tested after 10 months of operation measured 8,009 RLUs. This ice machine is twice as contaminated as the worst thing that they could possibly have tested in that test, and that was 4,000 RLUs. The ice machine with the fresher UV ice UV lamp was two. 8,009 to two. This is indicative of how effective UVC light is and uh, how, what possible contaminants could be growing in an ice machine, but certainly any dark, damp, cool environment will be prone to the same type of microbial growth. It just so happens that this is an ice machine where we're directly consuming the ice. 
So that brings us to, uh, to piggyback off of my earlier point about the facility coil is addressing the HVAC system itself. And as we know, the coil makes up uh, a, a tightly packed, there's, there's tightly packed fins. And as the, just upon commissioning of the equipment, there is a microbial growth called biofilm that starts growing and insulating those fins. So as as tightly packed as they are, once that biofilm starts growing, they become even more restrictive. You have heat transfer loss, airflow restriction, wear and tear. The system has to work harder in order to keep the conditioned air where the occupant wants it to be. It is a huge issue. You bring in a, 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 com a company to pressure wash or chemical clean, and almost immediately it starts up again. It's a, it, it's a vicious cycle. Now, of course, there is real dollars and cents here. I mean, it's costing a lot of resources to run a foul coil, not to mention the microbial blow off and the odors often called uh, dirty sock syndrome that must be mildewy smell when the blower kicks in, pushes that odor out into the uh, working or living area. It is a huge issue. So always what we uh, like to promote is mounting a UV system on an evaporator coil inside the air handling unit. And of course, besides treating the uh, biologicals and treating the air, we're also addressing the equipment itself, improving equipment, equipment efficiency, improving heat transfer, reducing, uh, improving uh, airflow, reducing wear and tear. The system does not have to work as hard and it is a great solution and a green solution to keep the equipment running to spec. And I often get asked, well, do we clean the coil first and then mount the UV system? Well, best practices would be yes, you, you clean, the, clean the coil, or if it's a new coil, you mount it with the UV system already and, and you're in a, in a much better position. But quite, quite frankly, most common uh, retrofit, and retrofit still makes up probably 90% of the UV market, is uh, just mount the UV system. And, and this here is a great example of, of just that. This was a pretty foul coil measuring 327,000 CFUs, and that's fungus and bacteria. And they mounted the UV systems. They returned in a couple of weeks for the post-test. And from 327,000 CFUs, it went down, was reduced down to two. That's a five log reduction. That's a 99.999% reduction in microbial load. Microbial load that would have been reintroduced back into the facility along with biologicals, chemical, uh, and odors. So this is another reason, and I, I mentioned it earlier, why uh, healthcare providers and engineers and scientists and doctors really do embrace UV is that I could do this test a hundred times and it'll always be the same. It is well understood what the dosage requirements are. And as long as we deliver that dosage requirement, we will always, always have the same result. So that brings us to the two different types of UV strategies for your buildings. There's mounting UV systems in the air handling unit and mounting UV systems in the ductwork. And we have two different um, uh, philosophies. I, I guess you could say it like that. So certainly uh, understanding the facility, understanding uh, air recirculation rates do play a major factor in deciding what is the right UV system for, for you and your facilities. So of course, the first picture you see there is UV lights on the air handling unit, on the coil, always addressing the coil, the surfaces, and continually treating the air as the air recirculates and passes through the coil section. But then we have this other product, which is a parallel orientation to airflow, which is mounted in the ductwork. And this is designed to maximize the exposure time between the UV light and the moving air. So typically you will get a much higher first, uh, first pass reduction when mounting a system in that configuration versus mounting unit inside the air handling unit. But the question remains is what is the right product for you? And that's again, where we wanna understand the application. So if we're looking at a hospital, and you contact me and say, Aaron, I've got a facility. We want to put UV lights to address airborne viral contaminants. It's an operating room. Well, chances are the, the hospital is bringing in 100% makeup air. And as I mentioned earlier, I talked about sunburns, how one sunburn won't be an issue for anybody, but continually abusing the sun with enough sunburns over the course of their life will eventually lead to a mutation, which presents itself as skin cancer. Well, for a hospital, we don't have that second, third, fourth sunburn. We don't have that, we don't enjoy the ability for the accumulation of a dosage. We have to deliver that lethal dosage on one pass. So if we're doing a healthcare facility, 
where we have to guarantee a very high log reduction on one pass of air, then we're going to go with that parallel orientation to airflow. That duck mount unit that is uh, could range from two lamps to six lamps, from 18 inches to 60 inches, they're sized according to duct dimensions and CFM and the desired biological inactivation rate. But that's for those hospital grade air quality applications. Now I was, I was interviewed by a, a, a journal uh, a couple of months ago and, and asked me what is gonna be the mistake that engineers and contractors are gonna make when sizing UV systems. And, and my answer was, everyone's gonna be oversizing, everyone's gonna want hospital grade air quality. And the fact of the matter is that most facilities, most end users don't need that level of, of, contam of, of disinfection to address those contaminants. And, and a good example is, is the next example, which is probably the, the majority of the uh, applications you're going to address. So for, for office buildings, for schools, for shopping malls, we don't bring in 100% makeup air. Typically, we, we, we circulate and we're looking at about four to six air recirculation rates an hour. So if we don't deliver that lethal sunburn on that first pass, by the second, third, fourth pass, we will achieve that accumulation of the dosage to effectively address the biologicals in about 30 minutes to an hour. So it really is having that understanding of what does the customer want. If they want, if you want to have that high log reduction on a single pass, we could deliver that. Of course, you're going to need more UV to achieve it because it's a question of dosage requirements. But if we do enjoy air recirculation rates and we do not have to have that critical air air quality, then certainly having a, a, a different format UV system is the way to go. So for facilities and schools and shopping malls, I like to switch gears and I like to go with the coil mount solution. And the reason why I like to do, go with that solution is because let's not lose sight that the coil in the drain pan is a source of biological contamination. And there is the additional benefit of improving equipment efficiency. And typically by putting a, enough UV systems, as you see here on a coil, we will have enough dosage to effectively address the moving air as the air continually recirculates through the facility. So I do like to use the coil mount solutions because it really does address a lot of IQ issues where the uh, duct mount unit really is specific to high level airborne viral or bacterial inactivation. The third scenario is agriculture facilities, and they bring up to 50, uh, they, they change the air up to 50 times, uh, humidity, uh, you know, uh, uh, CO2, there's reasons why they want to turn the air a lot. So comparatively speaking, we could use even less UV for agricultural applications versus an office building or, or a, a hospital. But this just puts into perspective the three different types of applications, low research, uh, medium research and very high research, and then we tailor the UV solution accordingly. Now, Kelly has been doing very well in promoting our UV systems for coil disinfection and air disinfection. And the nice thing about this, this specific product, the BTXL, it's, it's very, very flexible. There's a lot of different applications. We could use it for coil mount. We could even use it for duct mount. It depends on how we uh, format the installation. Now, installation is really simple. Everything you need is included in the package, in the kit, so to speak. Now, a lot of manufacturers over-engineer their, uh, their metalwork, their bracketry, and we try to make things very easy. There's no reason why the brackets and the metal should be more expensive to ship than the cost of the lamps and the power supplies and the wire set and everything else that goes along with the UV system. So as you see here, this is what is included in our BTXL. We have our 12 inch brackets, which you see on top, which is mounted to either to the wall of the air handling unit or the frame of the coil, half inch EMT conduit, which is included in the kit and the lamps clip right to the kit. Very, very simple installation, it takes only minutes and uh, we want you in and we want you out. We don't wanna over-engineer the actual installation. The second example is similar in that we also have magnets. As I mentioned, we're big on magnets. So if we could use magnets, we'll typically use them because it will make life a little bit easier in some respects. If it's a rooftop package unit, why use a screw if you could use a magnet? So we do try to make life very easy for those installations. 
But of course, these products are scalable and they could be used in any size air handling unit. We just have to uh, use more of them, right? So the lamps themselves range in size from 12 inches to 60 inches. They are high output UVC lamps. And as you see there, we have different options available such as the magnet or the uh, 12 inch bracket, which actually comes included in the kit. The power supply is 110 to 277 volt. And what's nice about the fresh air UV power supply is it could uh, light additional lamps. So if you need two 60 inch lamps, then you could use one of our dual power supplies. You don't need one power supply per lamp. So it does make installation a lot more manageable as far as installation and installation costs. The systems are tied in through an interlock safety switch on the door. So should a door or access panel be open during operation, it turns the lights off. And then obviously once the door is closed, you re-energize the system. It's a very, very flexible modular uh, um, application. Uh, what you see there is from a high profile installation in Washington, DC. So we do the smallest rooftop units, the largest air handling units, and the systems are guaranteed for life. The lamps themselves carry their own two year lamp life, but everything else, as far as the power supply, the brackets, the wire set, everything else associated with this system carries a lifetime guarantee. Now we do have optional accessories, uh, everything from uh, reflectors. So case in point, the bottom left picture, you see a reflector there. These are clip on reflectors. In some instances, they want to install UV systems on a very fouled and dirty coil. And they wanna take all that UV energy and direct it where they want it, which is the coil itself. So they'll use the clip for a few months. And then after the coil is eventually clean, they would remove the clip so you could irradiate 360 degrees, address the, the walls and the blower housing and other areas of the air handling unit, as well as treat the air as the air is entering and obviously exiting. We have uh, BMS options and control box options as well. The, uh, the last picture you see, you see there is an example of our control box option. Uh, we uh, oftentimes for this level of control, we use a sensor, a UV sensor called the radiometer. We would use this for let's say a bioterrorism application where they wanna guarantee a certain level of UV dosage or UV irradiance intensity to make sure that the units are running as they should in order to address biological contaminants that may be passing through the system. So the radiometer is measuring the UV intensity, the irradiance in real time, and should anything happen to a lamp, if the irradiance drops below a predetermined level, it'll uh, uh, notify through either the control panel or BMS that there's an issue. So we do have very, very elaborate control options as well, but 98% of the installations are just typically the, uh, the power supply, the lamps, and, and a safety interlock switch, and they're tied in accordingly and it really makes for a very easy uh, system. As I mentioned, we call this kit the, the Bluetooth XL uh, through Kelly and everything you need for this installation is already pre-packaged, pre-kitted, and we try to make uh, sizing as easy as possible for you. But of course, should you require that high level air disinfection application, that one pass neutralization, we do have our BTXL ADS, air disinfection system conversion. And there's nothing you need additionally, everything you need for this installation is already included in the BTXL. It's just, how are you installing it? So in this case, we have to make the decision which length of lamp we want. They range in size from 18 to 60 inches, and they range from two lamps to four lamps to six lamps. And if we are doing a very large system or very, very fast velocities, we could use multiple ADS systems. But the concept of the ADS is that you want to deliver the necessary UV dosage, um, allowing for that dwell time. And as the air is passing through the ductwork, it reaches that UV field with the parallel orientation to airflow. And as the air enters that UV field, you're able to address the air as the air is being obviously uh, sterilized by, by the UVC light. The uh, ADS can be mounted in both a parallel orientation, which you see there. And in some instances, we do use what we call grid style, 
uh, as you see there, it's it's really just it's mounted on a 45 degree angle again to extend the parallel orientation to airflow, but it, it covers more la more ductwork on a single pass. But the most common application for these types of systems is no is definitely the uh, um, axial type we call it, which is the parallel torpedo type format mounted in the center of the ductwork. Now there's a lot of types of UV lamps, and and uh, it's nice to have an understanding of the kind of lamp. There's there's uh, lamps called soft glass, which is a soda lime uh, mineral, and then there's quartz glass, and, and we use quartz glass lamps in our UV systems. Uh, our, we have lamps that last one year and, and two years, and we even have lamps that have a special uh, Teflon encapsulation uh, should a lamp break, no glass uh, or, or mercury could escape, and we would use that for uh, you know, sensitive applications like food, food production and things of that nature. But what's so unique about the fresh air UV quartz glass lamps is that they are high output. There's their standard output lamps at 400 milliamps. These are high output UVC lamps at 800 milliamps. They do not produce ozone. They're doped. There's an internal dope doping of the glass that allows the UVC light at 254 nanometer to be produced, but it will not allow the light uh, to the boys like to drop down at the 155, 185 that would produce ozone. So these are non ozone producing. We have uh, getters and there's two rings. You see the rings there in, in the illustration, which really differentiates our one year from our two year lamps. Our two year lamps use these getters and these getters absorb the impurities in the gas as the lamp ages. So as the lamp ages, there's pollutants that build up in the gas that ultimately will cause the drop in UV output. By using the getters, which act as filters, they, inc they, uh, they absorb those impurities, making for a much stable lamp over the course of its two-year lamp life, those 18,000 hours. We use a special anti-solarization coating on the inside of the lamps. If you've seen lamps from, from a decade or so ago, you might have noticed that, that after six months to a year, there would start to be this mirroring effect that would happen on the lamp itself, almost like mirrored sunglasses. Well, these new anti-solarization coatings that are incorporated into our two-year lamps negate that mirroring effect. So it, it's really um, it made a huge difference over the last decade or so. Our lamps are 15 millimeter lamps, and that's really important. Uh, what will dictate performance of a lamp? Oftentimes it's temperature of the lamp. When a lamp cools, the efficiency will drop as a result. And oftentimes we'll have to use more lamps to make up for that drop in efficiency. But if we're able to use a 15 millimeter versus a thicker lamp, we're able to not have as much surface area and keep the lamp warmer. So a warmer lamp is a better lamp and our 15 millimeter UV high output lamps do uh, produce uh, and sustain better output over the course of its two years under airflow. And as I mentioned, we do have that Teflon encapsulation should uh, that sensitive application require it. We try to make sizing really, really simple. And on the uh, BTXL uh, spec sheet, we have this cross-reference matrix on sizing. So you just line up what size, the width and height of the coil, and that'll tell you how many fixtures you're gonna need. In the example in the bottom right corner, for a, a 40 inch high by 48 inch wide, it'd be one single UV lamp. Typically uh, for coil disinfection, it's one lamp every 30 to 40 inches. Uh, but when we start shifting gears and we start using these uh, coil mount units for air disinfection, we will suggest one lamp every 10 inches or so. And that will make up for the fact that you do have a much uh, a, a larger amount of area to disinfect. What is nice about disinfecting in the air handling unit itself versus ductwork is that the velocity is moving slower. So if we're you know, enjoying a thousand feet per minute in the supply duct, then obviously our system has to be designed in an orientation to maximize exposure to a thousand feet per minute. When we're doing an air handling unit, it's gonna range you know, 400, 500 feet per minute. So the slower air velocity does lend itself very well to, uh, to ultraviolet. So even though the lamps are perpendicular to airflow, the air is still moving slower and we do put more UV lamps in order to do a better job. So in the case of the 40 inch by 48 inch coil um, illustration, we would use two dual lamps. So two dual 46 inch lamps would be effective for on the fly air disinfection for that example there. 
Now, of course, we do make life easy for you and we do have these cross-reference matrices, but we do have sizing uh, uh, calculations as well. We have a very, very robust blue calc sizing program, industry leading. And we do have a, a survey and we ask you to fill out the survey if you want us to tailor our sizing uh, calculations to your specific application. So what we typically ask is uh, width and height of the coil and CFM, as well as duct dimensions, uh, width and height of the duct for our airstream disinfection. And we will take those numbers and we will base it on any number of biological target. We could base it on, I like using Aspirilus Niger for coil disinfection. As you uh, recall, I pointed out Aspirilus Niger as the hardest of all bacterial spores to inactivate using UV light, requiring 330,000 microwatts. So we like to use that as our de facto um, uh, benchmark pathogen for coil irradiation, but we also have many uh, other funguses and viruses. Adenovirus is about seven times more resistant to UV than coronavirus. So we do like using that as our benchmark as well. But certainly if you or your customer or you as a facility uh, owner have um, a specific target in mind, we could base our calculations on that target. <coughs> so this is an example of the report that we will give to you. So the one on the left is air disinfection, the one on the right is coil irradiation. And we try to be as transparent as we possibly can. And again, another example why uh, a scientist and healthcare providers really do embrace UV is because we could give a report like this. We could substantiate inactivation more so than any other, UV, any other IAQ technology for that matter by providing this kind of transparent data. So you will know exactly the consumption, the power consumption, uh, the wattage, the uh, microwatts or millijoules of dosage, how fast the air is moving by the lamps and what the neutralization will be per pass. So what you have on the left side is an example of a 36 by 24 inch duct moving air at just over a thousand feet per minute. On this uh, specific example with our ADS, 60 inch, so our largest 60 inch ADS parallel to airflow, we're achieving a, at least a, uh, a, a one log and, and oftentimes a three log reduction on a single pass. And if we selected a, a, a six pass, that's our two options, single pass or six pass for recirculation, they would all obviously be in a four log reduction as well. So we, we, are, we have a very strong understanding of what dosage requirements may need to be delivered and the calculation software does an exceptional job of running those simulations. The other example, as you see there is, is coil disinfection. And again, we're using Aspel's Niger and you know exactly what the uh, survival time will be on the biological target, what the dosage requirements are. So we do get very uh, in-depth detailed as far as the information we provide. So this is something that is available obviously to you. The BTXL can also be used for ceiling and wall mount applications. And uh, certainly in, in March and April of last year, these systems were just, we could not even keep them in stock. They were being used to complement uh, 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 terminal cleaning practices for high touch surfaces. They were probably using them for rooms. I know they were using them for rooms where they would mount them on the ceiling and the wall and they would put all the N95s on a, on a coat rack and they would wheel it in and then spend a few minutes irradiating the, the, the PPE. And they were using these in all kinds of innovative means. But all this to say is that the BTX cell can be used also for these uh, innovative room type applications for unoccupied spaces. We are one of the, uh, you know, we, we are so lucky. I pointed out uh, how proud we are of our, of our people, of our departments, and, and, and certainly our research and development team, our engineering team uh, are, are doing such amazing things. And, and one of the most important tools they have in their arsenal is an ASHRAE 52-2 test rate. This is ours. There's only about a few of them in, in, in the US. And um, what allow, this allows us to do is test when we need a test. These are over half a million dollars and it, it, it gives us the flexibility to continually improve our equipment. So it's not uncommon for us to, to reevaluate, retest and continually improve on the design of our systems. And the ASHRAE 52.2 test rig allows us to do just that. We do have a lot of test data available um, both for, for on the fly ear stream disinfection, for coil disinfection, for uh, unique applications like ice machines and, and ductless, as well as what I discussed earlier in the presentation regarding the American Journal of Infection Control. 
uh, research that we've uh, that has been done on our products on N95. Uh, we are often called uh, for uh, our contribution to um, publications and associations. We write articles all the time for hospital associated infections to um, you know consumer products that produce ozone and other uh, technologies. Um, even, even hospital associated infections and, and subjects on coronavirus. So we are often called as the experts in the field. We did win the AHR Innovation Award in IAQ in 2020. And uh, if not for this Zoom presentation, we would be out there giving in-person presentations. And that's really where we excel is conveying the message of, of ultraviolet and fresh air UV. Find us on social media. We put a lot of information out there, a lot of news uh, events, and details on, on, on IQ, on HVAC, on fresher UV. So feel free to find us on, on Facebook and LinkedIn. And, and for that, I, I really do thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kelly, for inviting us. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. We so appreciate you uh, coming and being here with us today as our supplier partner here at Kelly. Um, we do have quite a few questions. Hopefully we can get to them all. If not, uh, you guys, just so you're aware, Kelly does have a technical team um, on staff. They are well-versed in UV disinfection as well. So if we do not hit your question today, we will personally have someone reach out to you. Um, and then of course, all our sales staff can um, is well-versed as well. So we'll be sure to help you there if we do not get to your question, but we're certainly going to try. So let's just roll right in. Um, so we've got quite a few questions in our Q&A. The first one's from Eric. Do you have a radiometer with an analog output? Um, most of our radiometers are all, all, all digital. So mm -hmm. the answer would be no. Gotcha. Um, the next one's from John. Uh, and I'm assuming, John, this is in reference to the life of the lamp. Uh, so is that 24-7 operation for one and two year lamps? Yes, so the lamps are rated in hours. So 8,000 hours for one year, 16,000 hours for two years. So it would be a two year continual operation if uh, for whatever reason the lamp is cycled or the lamp is off for you know six months of the year, then you would get four, four years from the lamp. So there's no shelf life on the lamp. It's not gonna go bad, uh, but certainly when we rate a lamp, it's on uh, actual, uh, when it's energized. So it'd be two years of continual operation. Gotcha. The next one's from Philip. Do you have um, mercury in these? And I believe it was in reference to the quartz glass. Um, if so, are they safe for air? Yeah, so the, they are low mercury content lamps. They have the exact, the anatomy and the design and the amount of mercury is exactly the same as a fluorescent fixture. So whatever a fluorescent would have, that's what a, a, a mercury vapor UV lamp would have. It is just the design of the lamp and you need the mercury vapor gas in order to achieve that, you know, that, that to energize it to achieve the 254 nanometer. Uh, so as far as safety precautions, you would handle it the same way you would handle any fluorescent lamp. And as far as disposal, the same goes, goes with that as well. So it, it is a low mercury content uh, lamp. Great, thank you. And then the next one, we're just rolling through these um, from Jim. Please address regular maintenance requirements. So what's your recommendations there? Uh, you know, they're very forgiving. Uh, the lamps have the ability to essentially really stay clean, even in, in very um, um, severe conditions. So, it, it, you know, I would monitor the lamp, monitor in the sense that what I didn't discuss is, is, is exposure. You never want to expose yourself to any direct line of sight with the ultraviolet light. That's why those interlocks are so important on the door. With that being said, uh, a face shield, uh, protect your eyes and skin, that's it. And you could, you know, monitor to make sure the lamp is a functioning. As far as cleaning, um, depending on the application, there really isn't anything required as far as maintaining the lamp. But in some uh, applications where there might be a lot of uh, bioaerosols or grease-laden air, you might want to monitor every six months, maybe use some alcohol to clean off any sort of um, um, coating that might happen. But it, it is so rare. Uh, at the beginning, you know, 20 years ago, we used to say, you know, monitor the labs every three months, clean them. And then we started noticing uh, very early on that there was no cleaning required. So I would just say, just keep on top of the lamps, making sure that they're, they're, they're lighting up as, as required. And then just 
change their lamps on a, on a timely manner. If it's every two years, do it every two years uh, because the lamps are going to last. The lamps are not going to just stop working after two years. They could last for four years, five years, who knows? But the ultraviolet light does decrease with age. And after two years of operation, it has reached the point where you should be replacing with new lamps. Gotcha. Great information. Benjamin, he asked, what components in a duct AHU are most susceptible, susceptible to de degradation, I can't talk today, due to UVC lighting? Are special UV resistant coil coatings required? Uh, no. So, you know, back in the day, we used to say, uh, you know, plastic drain pans, especially on the residential side to shield them and, and put aluminum. And then we, it, it really was became a non, it was a non-issue. So fast forward so many years later, a lot of uh, uh, materials have UV inhibitors already built into the, the product, the plastic, the polymer, the synthetic, but it really is the synthetics that we have to be concerned about. Right. So rubber belts, not an issue. The UV doesn't, but studies show that the UV does not penetrate more than 10 microns into the surface of the material. So uh, ABS plastic, no problem. Vulcanized rubber, no problem. A pl hard plastic, no problem. Maybe a slight discoloration at that. What you want to be cautious about is foam, any sort of foam, soft foam. You don't want UV irradiating directly. Direct exposure to soft foam will be problematic. So you want to use some aluminum tape to shield direct exposure. You uh, uh, wiring, soft wiring, shielding on wiring that uh, may be a direct exposure to the light. You want to shield again with aluminum tape. So you don't want any exposed wiring just dangling there where the UV light is, is irradiating. You'll, you'll break, break those polymers. And um, lastly is probably synthetic filter media, not fiberglass. Fiberglass is fine. Uh, duct insulation is fine. It's um, you know polyester synthetic media, uh, which typically because our UV systems are mounted on the on the downstream side, the wet side of the coil, that's really where the beneficial insulation location is. So you irradiate the coil in the drain pan. But in some instances, maybe uh, limitations in space or whatever the case may be, you might have to put it on the upstream side. So you just want to be sure that if you are installing a UV system that's in direct um, contact with some sort of synthetic filter media that you do uh, take that into account. HEPAs are, are seemingly not an issue as well. So hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Tony says, what are the watts per foot? So it depends on what you want to size. Uh, the lamps, UVC lamps have the ability to uh, tra it translate about 40%. 40% of the power is actually emitted out in UVC light. Uh, it, it really is a, um, a question I don't want to answer simply because there's depending on the dosage and what we want to achieve will dictate what the power consumption will be. Case in point, you saw that example of that one coil with a single lamp, and that would be perfectly fine for coil disinfection, but that single lamp in a 48 inch by 40 inch high coil will certainly not be uh, powerful enough for air disinfection. So you would need four times the amount of lamp. So that's part of the benefit of the uh, calculation software that we have is that when you do get a report, you will see in real time what the power will be for inactivating that particular scenario. Okay, great. Um, Rick asked, what are the differences, advantages and disadvantages of UV versus bipolar ionization systems? Uh, you know what? The, the, the bipolar is, is new. Um, it, actually, it's not new. It's been used for many, many years, decades and decades and decades. So bipolar is great as an agglomerate uh, to agglomerate. So the, the her history of bipolar is that it was used for sensitive electronics in order to uh, use almost like a magnet. You pull the particles off sensitive electronics before it gets packaged or, or shipped out. And these are these ion bars. Fast forward now and companies are making uh, uh, marketing claims that they're very effective at inactivating, neutralizing contaminants inside spaces. And there's just no data to support this. And that's highlighted very well by ASHRAE and, and their epidemic task force. I think bipolar is a great, great adjunct to filtration. So if you're telling me that you want to improve your filtration, you use ionizers that agglomerate and attract. So a smaller particle that would pass through a filter now becomes larger and larger because of agglomeration, those negative and positive, they attract to each other. Now you're improving your filtration. But as far as data to show that it's effective at neutralizing viruses and bacteria in how it's designed to work, it's fine to take an ionizer and put it into a small one cubic volume of air and run it for 24 hours. But it's another thing taking that same unit, putting in the ductwork with moving air and doing a 20,000 cubic feet uh, facility. It just doesn't translate. So uh, UV light uh, has thousands, 
thousands of peer reviewed research data to show that it works as, as designed. And I would complement UV with bipolar in order to improve the filtration side of what the facility wants to do. Great. Um, Jason asks, will UVC penetrate an eight to 10 row CW coil in reference to cleaning coils? Well, you know, it depends on the depth of, of the coil. Um, UV light over time. Time is, is, is the overriding factor here. Uh, typically, if you go over, I would say, over 13 inches, over 10 to 13 inch, let's say 13 inch coil, you'd probably want to put a lamp on the other side, not necessarily as many lamps as you would have on one side, but to complement what is happening on the other side. But uh, location is really, really, really strategic. That's why we always, we try to um, promote mounting a UV system on the downstream side of the coil. So you get that drain pan. Uh, because yes, if you put a UV light on the upstream side, that light will not, I mean, it, it will not make it down into the drain pan. So mounting uh, maybe uh, uh, the lamp at the, as the sizing recommends on the downstream side, and then maybe putting a, a few lamps or a booster lamp, so to speak, on the upstream side, if we need to get that full penetration through. But over, over the course of weeks, you see how UV works is it's measured as you saw it in microwatts, but there's another component, which is microwatts per centimeter per second. And although you saw those numbers of, um, you know, 330,000 microwatts to inactivate Aspirillus niger, that is the accumulation of the dosage. But if let's say, you were to take the UV radiometer and measure UV dosage at a distance, you know, at let's say three or four microwatts, right? That's a far cry from the 15,000 microwatts you would measure close to the lamp, uh, but that's per second. So after a, a, a day, a, a, a week, a month, you've already delivered millions and millions of accumulated dosages on that surface. So maybe not enough to penetrate through a two foot coil, but certainly over the course of months, it will do a very good job of eventually getting through and inactivating what's inside that, that coil. Great. Um, the next question is from Rick. Does the performance of UV lamps deteriorate over time? Lamps age. The lamps age. So the lamp goes first, first it goes through what is called a burn-in. So for the first hundred hours of operation, there is an equilibrium that the gas mixture has to, has to settle, so to speak. And then after that hundred hours, it's pretty stable. Uh, in the core, with, it, with our two-year lamp, with the anti-solarization coating, the 800 milliamp high output lamp with the getters, uh, of course, all add to the ability for it to sustain a more stable and higher output lamp over the course of those two years. So you're looking at about a 15% efficiency drop. So you're 85% effective at the end of two years. So certainly uh, you've probably gone to the two into the three years because you, you've only lost 15%. But when we do our, our calculations, we are very conservative and we do our calculations at end of lamp life, which is two years. So those blue calc sizing recommendations you saw was as if, okay, it's two years of elapsed. Tomorrow, the facility is getting brand new lamps. Um, but yeah, lamps age, uh, about 85% effective at, at two years. Okay. And we have time for one more question. Again, for those of you who had questions we weren't able to hit, we will certainly reach out to you personally. We do have staff at Kelly that are well-versed in this, um, uh, this subject matter as well. So you can certainly reach out to us. Um, but the last question is from Mark. Is this UV technology being used or adapted somehow in cooling towers to disinfect against Legionella? Great question. Uh, Le Legionella, as you saw on the chart, is very susceptible to UV. The problem we have with cooling towers is obviously is containing the light. That, that's essentially what the issue is. So unfortunately, because of the nature of the outdoor environment and nature of a, of a cooling tower, uh, it, it would be very hard. I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that it's never been done. I'm sure it has, uh, but it, it is a problematic s solution. Um, taking that a little bit further, obviously, you know, uh, a stagnant drain pan is a, is a huge issue. And this, this is one point I just can't stress enough is that it's all great to talk about SARS-CoV-2 and how important it is to inactivate viruses in the air, and obviously all of that. But certainly uh, we've been doing ourselves a disservice all these years of not addressing the air handling unit. And with uh, a drain pan, stagnant water, that Legionella could certainly be an issue inside the drain pan as well. So as I mentioned multiple times during the presentation, addressing that evaporative coil, the air handling unit is definitely a great strategy. So we can't, I don't think we really want to do cooling towers right now, but certainly 
uh, we could do part of the, we, we could solve part of the problem with, with normal air handling maintenance and, and disinfection. Awesome. Well, Aaron, if you don't mind, I'd um, like to take over the screen real quick to close us out. I will share my screen so that all of you have the ability to contact us should you do, um, should you have additional questions, um, as well as, again, we'll try and reach out to those of you who had questions we weren't able to hit today. Um, so on the screen here, you'll see our number, our emails. Again, we have our cell staff who can always assist you with whatever questions you have. And then of course, our actual technical experts on hand that can help you with your technical questions and troubleshooting and, and anything um, related to those matters. And then of course, on kelly.com, we have options to chat with you. With that being said, I am gonna turn it over to Tina to close us out for the day. Tina? Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and a special thank you to our supplier partner, Fresh Air UV, for diving in on these product offerings. Um, Kelly is in a stocking position for several of the lines that we did discuss today. So I used the contact slide to reach out to Kelly um, to go over any additional questions or look for some sizing measures um, or to fulfill orders. Um, we hope you walk away knowing that Kelly is committed to serving you during this time and, and always. Uh, we'll continue to innovate and look forward to your feedback on how we can make your lives easier. So stay safe uh, and hope, uh, hope to see you on the next webinar. Right. Thank you guys so much. You are free to go. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure.